Uh, I'm going to talk about mobile technologies in dementia care, and in particular in residential homes, where most people with the more advanced uh, forms of dementia do and are going to live in the foreseeable future. In particular, I'm going to talk about using digital support for something that the care sector talks about, person-centered care, which is basically about treating everybody as an individual in terms of their past, their current, and indeed their future. Because people in care homes still have a future. They can often be there for a long time. People often think it's the place you put them. That's not true. So there's this strong notion of person-centered care. I'm going to talk about how we developed, uh, almost by accident, a mobile technology, or at least we repurposed a mobile technology to support the carers, and then it's evaluation over nine months in one home, really as a pilot exercise in a sector where there is very little use of digital technology. If you're looking for a place that you might not make money, but you can make a difference with technology, residential care is one of them. And as you're aware from the general media, it is a sector that's in crisis at the moment. So we as a community, I think, can do something in that space. So there's lots of numbers there. Um, dementia is still a big problem. There are, you know, there's been sort of counter arguments that the, uh, the scare stories aren't quite as scary as uh, people said. But it's estimated that the annual cost worldwide by 2029 is going to be two trillion US dollars of care and the consequences. So it's a big issue for us in the most of our lifetime. Um, one model that's been developed by Tom Kitwood over the and his followers in the last 20 years is this notion of person-centered care, which I just described. It's very much focused on treating and caring for each person in terms of their individual needs, background, preferences, and so on. Not, it's the opposite of the Hattie Jakes sister going through a ward of Sid James's and so on, treating them all the same. You, you adapt the care to the individual. And that requires skilled, knowledgeable, and learning carers. And indeed, one of the things I learned in hanging around in care homes and working with carers in, uh, in about 2010 was that actually at the ends of people's lives, these carers are responsible for maintaining the very essence of the person that is there in front of them, the very essence of being. It was a real shock to me when I first understood the importance of this role. And so it inspired us to start thinking about how we could use technologies in a sector there was very little technology out there. As I say, there isn't much computer science research and application work that's been done. And interestingly, most of what has been done has focused on what people generally call the patient. Never called them the patient, by the way. Um, uh, they're, they're older people. Um, and the challenge there is that delivering person-centered care is primarily the remit of the carer. You need to support the carer. And therefore, you're going to get the biggest effect from the technology. It's better to develop the technology for use by the carer so they can deliver care rather than it is for the older person with dementia or Alzheimer's. So I think a lot of the work, whilst worthy, is actually missing a trick in the sector. So we've been focusing over the last five to six years on developing new technologies for carers. Um, I'm sure many people have been in residential care homes. This is where this is the working office of a typical carer in a residential home. They're in people's rooms, they're in the dining rooms, they're in the lounges. There isn't a bespoke work area where these people hang out. There's a kind of very 70s vibe in a lot of these places. I can't give you the full five cents experience of being in a care home here. Maybe, maybe I could actually. Maybe I need some of your um, bags back actually for that. <laughs> um, and the work in these homes has a number of characteristics that you'll read about in the national press and so on. It is quite physical. I'm surprised, I was surprised how physical this work was. It's endlessly mobile because they're constantly moving around the homes. I'd love to know how many steps carers do in a day, but it must be well over the 10,000. It's very emotional work because you're often seeing people at the end of their lives who you've cared for. As most of us are aware, there's very little social recognition and it's poorly paid. So you're doing something that's so profound at the end of somebody's life and yet there is such little pay. As a consequence, there's a lot of high staff turnover and lack of training and knowledge that's maintained. And it's very paper-based. There is very limited use of technology. And because you need to maintain information, for example, in a typical shift, it lasts eight hours. In a care home, somebody's there for 24. So at least there are three or four carers looking after one person in 24 hours. They can't sort of necessarily dovetail verbally. Therefore, there is a need for them to write stuff down. There's a legal requirement on daily care notes, but there is also real care value. People say, why are you supporting documentation? We're not. We're sharing, we're supporting important communication about people, their needs, their issues, their behaviors and states during that. So there is a need for a good documentation. 
And in particular, using that technology alongside and documentation, not only to support just writing things down, to support both reflective learning and creative thinking in person-centered care, being reflective and learning about what you're observing and what you're reading, so you understand your, your, your uh, residents better, so you can deliver better care, and then also thinking creatively about this, so you can individualize the care. We, we deploy creative technologies in order to facilitate person-centered care. So through all of this, we've been developing a number of different kinds of digital technologies uh, for supporting creative thinking about challenging behaviors. Uh, we've been thinking about digital life histories, uh, storybooks. We even have here a game, which is essentially a blended interaction game based on Cluedo to train them to be um, detectives, if you like. There's people you can talk to about that if you want. There's a room, for, actually there's quite a lot of people who worked on this project in the room, so they're going to answer the questions. This is working well for me tonight. So that's what we've been developing. And I'm going to focus in particular on one of those technologies, which was a mobile technology simply to replace the daily care record. There is a legal requirement on maintaining a daily care record primarily for traceability purposes to go back through the care of someone if they end up in hospital with an injury. And that's what it looks like. Like, it's a written form. You fill it out as things happen in date and time. And you've, you've normally written is handwritten, and it's in technology parlance, I would argue, a write only document. Because it ends up in these large ring binders in rooms at the top of a care home. If you want to go back and find out what happened, you need time and willingness and the ability to read your colleague's handwriting. So this is quite a serious issue. We kind of laugh, we're all sort of grinning, but this is actually quite serious. This is determining the quality or the lack of quality of lives at the end of people's lives. So we think there's, there was a real opportunity there and we were exploring early on. So back in 2010, when we started this work, learned people in the care sector said, oh, you'll never get them to use technology. No, 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 no. Lots of sucking between the teeth. They won't know how to use mobile technology. So there's a lot of patronizing statements from the care sector about their own employees. So we had a couple of favorite care homes. So we actually went into one for just a week and we just replaced the care notes. We actually did it just as a quick experiment. We replaced the care notes with some iPod touches. You're not allowed phones in the homes, but you're allowed iPod touches. And we simply replaced them with Twitter. We, 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 we removed the names, right? So we just explored it. We couldn't get the bloody devices back off the carers at the week. We were playing hide and seek in the toilets trying to find the bloody things, right? They were that motivated. There was a whole social esteem thing. Suddenly, their tool wasn't a big pen and a crappy bit of photocopied paper. It was a nice, shiny Apple iPod, the, the aesthetic thing. I know we didn't design it, but just changing the aesthetic of the tools of work changed their social esteem. And we thought, actually, there's something into, in this. And also the fact that it's mobile was really important because they had des you do have desktop computers and applications in care homes. But normally what happens is at the end of a shift, say at three o'clock, and I, I hate to sort of stereotype here, there's a lot, lot of mothers wanting to go home and get their kids from the school gates. You end up with a queue at the desktop computer and care notes don't get properly filled in because little Johnny is waiting at the school gates to be picked up. And there's lots of other similar reasons why this sort of desktop computer technology acts as a barrier. So we thought, hell, um, why can't we start think about repurposing enterprise microblogging applications, not Twitter. This became known in care homes as the Yammer project, because we were actually going to start building our own tool. But we actually realized that 90% of the functionality we needed for communicating and sharing was actually delivered by microblogging tools. So we went with Yammer because we can wrap in all the privacy and security. And of course, we haven't got the 140 characters issue. So that's essentially what I'm going to talk about. I've built lot, we built lots of really fancy AI-based technology. This is about Yammer. <laughs> I have no shame, as my former students will testify. So this is kind of just giving you what it looks like. So we set up Twitter networks in care homes to support this. These are not real, uh, real residence names, in case you start wondering about Barbara and people. Um, we obviously made them up for this uh, demonstration. Um, so basically, a carer would, on, on logging into the device and picking up the device when they came on shift, would have an overview of all of their residents. They could easily navigate around the app. And whenever they wanted to uh, enter a care note or see the care notes, they could actually see them in the order in which they were happened. So you've actually got storytelling. There's a narrative appearing in the care notes because there's that structure. Um, you can very easily enter new care notes just using a keyboard. You know all of that sort of stuff. 
five minutes already, you're kidding me, helpy, helpy. And, and you can even then add comments, so other carers could comment on the care notes, you're using all the interleaving and conversational devices in these technologies. That was compared to that. They liked us. <laughs> It's amazing no one had thought to do this. And of course, you can also sort of use the desktop version of Yammer to do search. Going back through those ring arch binder files of data, you can go back and search where there was a pressure sore or what happened at night, etc. Um, we also, I'm going to skip over this since I've only got five minutes. Damn you, Caroline. Um, right, so we did, uh, we did a trial, uh, a number of trials, and this is the one that we did in, in South London. This ran for nine months in a care home. You might recognize it. I'm not going to name it, but uh, never mind. We used it with 20 carers on the dementia wing of a care home. So it's quite a large care home. The people with the most severe dementia lived in this brand new dementia wing. It was very unusual. It's quite unusual for care homes, very well set up. So we had 10 senior carers, eight assistants. Most of them had lots of experience and we also work with physiotherapists, activity coordinators, all of whom work together to make the quality of life of these people. So we, we did a three-phase study and in day one we just collect, in phase one, we just collected data about how the current base paper-based system worked as a baseline. And then in phase two we replaced the uh, paper and pen with just this app and in phase three we had the app plus the other thing that I'm not going to tell you about but the fact is it didn't work that well so it doesn't really matter, all right? <laughs> You've actually got me off the hook here on the shit stuff. Good, good on you. Right, uh, we looked at four questions. Oh, I'm going to skip over those as well. Um, here's what happened. Um, there's a lot of numbers here. I'm going too fast to make a lot of sense of it. But we basically counted things. Because of the, uh, the, the research ethics, we weren't allowed to see the data ourselves. So we had intermediaries analyzing all the care notes and doing all the data categorization. Um, people who work for the Registered Nursing Home Association, but they were trained scientists, so I trusted them. Um, and what is interesting is that you do actually see there is an improvement. You see, if you sort of average it out, you can see that an average number of, uh, of uh, words per care note is going up, and the average number of words recorded about carers today. We're getting increases in volume over time. And I did some stats, and basically there are significant improvements in these places. Um, yes, OK. Um, I'll skip over that as well. This is not good. There is an entire journal paper written on this we can direct you to. Uh, but what is interesting, there wasn't a lot of support for reflective learning. We were getting increases in more complete descriptions of resident states and their challenging behaviours and so on. But we weren't really getting any improvements in the reflective part, which was what this tool was designed to do. So this tool, which I didn't describe earlier, would actually pull together all relevant information about a resident over time. And then the carers would come together with reflective learning guidance on how to use this. However, this tool didn't really fit very effectively with the working practices. It seemed that when you asked them, they said, well, we're reflecting all the time. I had no reason to disagree with this because it's part of their longer term training. So our attempt to kind of structure it didn't really fit with their intense working practices. Um, other things we found, uh, multiple advantages of this technology. First of all, they could read the damn things rather than their colleagues' handwriting. This is very significant at breakthrough, I should say. Um, the care notes were far more accessible and searchable as before, um, and we just had general improvability of the improved usability of the system. There were interesting sort of emerging patterns of use. One thing they found actually was that the technologies enabled them to deliver care much more naturally because they're simply using this rather than turning up to the resident with a large number of ring binder files. You, you kind of laugh, but this is actually what happens if you need to go back through someone's care notes. So there's a much more natural way of delivering care. There was all sorts of issues. For example, some of the carers need glasses to read the small screen, but they don't want to have their glasses with them because sometimes the residents would rip them off or something like that. So there was all sorts of issues. One thing I liken this to is like running through endless walls. You solve a problem and then you hit another socio-technical barrier. Um, so there was all sorts of issues. Uh, our tool, for example, that enabled more effective traceability of who uncovered what bruises. But there's also the problem of the politics of blame. I don't want to be the person who was identified with finding the bruise. Now, that's a much wider issue than our technology could solve, but the precision in the technology throws this up. So there's lots of issues in the care sector which technology shines a greater light on. Um, and that did impede some of the uses of technology. I know you're telling me to stop. 
Um, right, the, the, you may be asking, did this actually improve people's quality of life? Yes, it did. There was an awful lot, certainly in areas such as post falls. They've fallen, they've gone into hospital, they come back. The, uh, the greater access and ability to search and parcel the notes actually did lead to improved qualities of life, according to the, uh, the carers who were then reporting back on the tools afterwards. All right, so it all kind of worked very well. Uh, what we are trying to do is integrate it with other tools now, such as uh, digital life histories and tools that we develop that are online, which enable you to, to do support, have creative thinking support about how to deal with particular challenging behaviours. I'm just going to leave that slide up there, shall I? Where's that really? 20 minutes? 15, but you, you can go for a couple more if you don't want any questions. No, 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 let's have questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm really interested in this. I wanted to know, um, would you, in order to increase accountability amongst the carers, uh, give uh, the families of the people who have someone in a care home the would they be able to basically look at the information yeah. that's been... That is an interesting point. Now, there's, a, there's, there's two sides to that argument. Typically, we were told that having, if the families were able to see the daily care notes, it might impede the carers from being truly honest about the state of the people that they saw, because you've got someone who's paying. So that's one side. However, on the other side, we worked with a, a digital agency last year, and they built a, a small function that would uh, create a kind of my, my, my family member this week, which sucked information out of the care notes and provided a kind of news summary. And that was actually seen to be really popular. So I think it would need careful selection and filtering of the notes. You know, if you know that, you know, she's sick again or he's fallen down the stairs, that might not be information you want to put out. So uh, I think there is value, but there's a risk and it needs to be carefully designed and understood what it means. The key is to keep the carers documenting more cle uh, completely and accurately. That's the basis on which care can be improved. Uh, let's go there and then I'll go around the back. Yes. With sensitivity data, how do you back that up and protect them? Um, with this data, we were using Yammer and other technologies. I can't, I'll let Christine mull over that. Um, in terms of uh, security, uh, we, we didn't worry too much. We, we were able to print everything off. So we were, in the end, this technology came out of the home again. So in, in the end, it all got printed. I know this is ironic. So it actually got printed up. And ironic, I, I know, I mean, this is a long story. So that was, a, that was a research way around this problem. Security is an interesting one. Security and privacy, everyone goes, oh, security and privacy. It's in the care sector, it's not seen to be that important. And everyone goes, oh, digital exposes. I could have walked out of care homes with so much information. You know, they, you have digital life history books, the sort of little books, di um, like, like um, scrapbooks of people's lives. I could have pocketed so many of those out of the lounges of care homes and walked out with them. So I think digital creates a false, mis false understanding. And most people in the care sector who actually work in there don't. This is not medical data, a lot of it. They don't worry too much about that. So I think these are secondary issues, to be honest. Has Christine got anything you want to add to that? That's fine, I'll, I'll go around. Gentlemen uh, over there. Yeah, so uh, I'm definitely going to come chat to you a bit later. Okay. I'm quite keen to know, is this actually a product? Like, can this actually no. be used? It's not a product. Um, it, well, Yammer's a product. So there's nothing to stop you considering how you might use these types of tools in commercial ways. Now, we started working with a number of agencies to turn this into something that was more adaptable, because clearly Yammer imposed constraints on us that were a pain in the end. So there were some things we wanted to do better. We wanted to better interoperate with some uh, clever parsing algorithms that we developed. So actually, uh, it isn't a product, but there's nothing to stop you understanding how you could deploy this in certain ways within the licensing restrictions of Yammer. Do you want it to be a product? Is that some your It's certainly, certainly something, something I'm pursuing, pursuing yes. Yeah, let's talk later. Uh, a, man in a, a man in a suit <laughs> offering me money, potentially. I like it. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Yeah, no, I'm teasing. Don't worry. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, the question is, is whether the, the notes that go in are editable by other people? And if so, is that an issue? What kind of an issue do you see that? Um, the, well, they, they technically could be edited, but they can't be edited through functions at the user level. Okay, so once a note is edited, it can't be, you can't go back and fix it because that's absolutely critical 
for the traceability. You can add a comment to it. You can say, I meant to say this, but you, that record is there and then, and that was an important feature of the original care notes. So it is a sort of, as it happens, record, at least it should be. Is that's, that the answer you were hoping for? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so, sorry. Any ideas on how you could improve the reflection that didn't quite work? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's got to be embedded more effectively with the kinds of care training that happen. Um, I, it's happened, I think it is genuinely happening little and often. One of the reasons we actually thought about using this for reflection was when they had to write, the, the, those, in that very short period we ran in 2010, you couldn't just start typing a care note if it's only 140 characters. Most of us know this. If you're tweeting something meaningful, you have to actually think about what you're going to write, right, to fit it into the 140 characters. So actually, we found that forcing them to write in a certain way actually encouraged a bit of reflection before they documented it, but it meant less completeness. So we were hoping we could try and embed that in the, the basic use of Yammer, but it didn't really work. It, allowing them just to write seemed to discourage reflection. So we thought about putting in little template structures in the care notes and so on, you know, the what and the why. Have you said why? And what we've now developed is a set of parsers to work on the back of this. So we're now parsing the meaning in care notes in, a lang in an adapted version of WordNet um, with reasonably sophisticated sense makers and parsers. And if we can't figure out a reason from it, if there's no indication of causality, we may then explore why. So that it becomes a more interactive, which is what we want to build into the, the app that I just mentioned a minute ago. So we build an interaction and AI. Carolyn, we uh, time up? Yep, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.